I did it again. I'm sorry. Let me start all over. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this, this day. Uh, I am Councilman James Tate representing District 1. And today we are here to uh, speak on something very important to a lot of people that has created both compliments and concern and complaints that we've received. And that is the Grand River Streetscape. For those of you who are uh, not aware, who's just tuned in for the first time, uh, the Grand River Streetscape is a multi-million dollar uh, development, uh, redevelopment of Grand River Avenue between the uh, stretch of Southfield Freeway, area, Southfield Freeway and Berg Road. Um, there's been, again, a lot of, uh, a lot of conversation about the project. Uh, it is the uh, second one over, not terribly far in this area. The first that we got an opportunity to see that looks very similar to it, but I'm sure there's some uh, changes and some differences that uh, we'll certainly be going over to this evening. But uh, Livernois Avenue, if you take a look there, there's some a lot of similarities. But I'm not going to continue to talk anymore. I'm going to uh, pass the mic. But I want to introduce all the folks who are gonna be joining us this evening. We're gonna be joined by Caitlin Marcone, who is the Deputy Director of Complete Streets uh, with Department of Public Works. We also have joining us, joining uh, with us, uh, Michelle Flournoy. She is the Urban Designer of Planning and Development Department. We also got some folks from the state of Michigan joining us and we'll bring them up a little bit later along with uh, Keith Hutchins, uh, Mr. K. Adef So, he's the uh, Detroit Transportation Managers, Detroit Transportation Service Centers Manager uh, with MDOT, and also Mr. Emil Asaw, the Project Manager of MDOT. And we also have heard about the concerns that people have had about the parking along the Grand River Streetscape. So we brought uh, and we're thankful for him. He's a late addition, but he did agree to be with us. He's got a short window of time today, so we want to make sure that we honor his time as well as each and every one of you. Mr. Keith Hutchins, who is the director of the Municipal Parking Department. Again, thank each and every one of you for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, I'm sure we will have, uh, we're going to make sure that it, it uh, is worth everyone's time being here this evening. I want to start off with uh, Caitlin. Uh, Kaylin, again, good evening. Thank you for joining us. If you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, the origins of the uh, Grand River Streetscape and, you know, uh, what are we, I'll let you begin. I, must, I know you have a PowerPoint, I believe, that you want to present. Yes, yes. Thank you, Councilman, for having me. And hello, District 1. Um, if we could pull up the slide deck, um, we're going to go through a little bit of the history of how we got to where um, to deciding on a Grand River streetscape um, through the design process and then also talk about um, existing conditions um, out there today. So um, if you just bear with us, um, next slide, we're going to get through the, the slide deck and then we will be happy to answer any questions that the audience or uh, council office might have. Um, next slide. But first we're going to start with um, the work that the planning and development department um, did before the design process started. And so I am going to kick over the mic quickly to Michelle Flournoy with planning and development. Great, thanks Caitlin and thank you Councilman Tate. Um, nice to be here. Good evening, everyone. Um, so the the project on Grand River really started with the Grand River Northwest Neighborhood Framework Plan, which kicked off in January of 2017. And even before we kicked off that work, we knew that the Grand River Corridor was important to the community because of the previous MDOT projects and um, the collaboration with um, GRDC in particular on, on some of the uh, pedestrian focused improvements from, um, you know, 10 years before that when the last streetscape project that, that came through. So, so we knew it would be a focus. We had um, over 20 meetings during that time. Eight of them were focused specifically on the streetscape. Uh, you can go to the, the next slide. And we, we really did start, this is sort of the high level discussions where we started asking of all of the corridors in the commercial corridors in the planning area, where were the priorities? And of all of the intersections, where were the priorities to the community? And this is an example of a polling um, question that was given 
during the planning process, we would have live polling at the, at the meetings. And so you can see the results here that um, while there are other corridors that are uh, important to District 1, Grand River came up again and again, and specifically the, the areas around Grand River and Lasser, as well as the, the corridor through Grandmont Rosedale with, with Outer Drive and um, Grand Land coming up as, as important for us to take a look at. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And at the same time that we were doing this neighborhood framework, DGC, the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, was also doing a retail study. And this is important because ties into this because they were able to look at quarters across the city and look at actual retail spending and, and potential. And Grand River actually came up as one of the, the highest demand corridors um, in, across the city. And there was um, a demand to fill 22 blocks of retail space. And um, this is sort of the square footages that that would fill. Um, the big takeaway is that there's a lot of demand for businesses to be located locally. And there were reasons that the design of the street itself was keeping away from that sort of walkable business district that the community wanted. Um, next slide. So again, we, we started at a really high level, you know, would, would the community like to see the, the same number of lanes? Would they like to see a change in the section? Um, the majority of people did want to see the, the number of lanes stay the same. Um, there was some interest in uh, a, a road diet, so we explored that. And then we started talking about all of the different amenities. And you can see here that from wider sidewalks to street striping, tree canopy, they all really had some interest level from the community. Next slide. And in sort of the last uh, hands-on meeting that we had, um, we actually got down into each individual table, each individual resident that came to the meeting was able to sort of play around with different street sections. And the big takeaways there um, are that we wanted to retain parking. We uh, were interested in stormwater infrastructure. We were interested in opportunities to take away the turn lane when it could help pedestrians crossing um, to be more safe. Um, and there, there was some interest in bike lanes, but um, sort of back and forth. So we took all of this and the, the biggest thing is that we documented this. Um, next slide. And, and that we were able to um, come up with a couple options that sort of addressed the, what we had heard. But really this is when we kicked it over and started the conversation with MDOT about actually doing a project here based on what we heard during the planning process. So I'll turn it back over to Caitlin um, to talk about how it went from there. Thanks, Michelle. We can go to the next slide. So after the planning study, when it was determined that Grand River was the street that um, the community would really like to see some investment in, the city of Detroit approached the Michigan Department of Transportation who has jurisdiction over Grand River. So they theoretically own the road um, and the city cannot make changes to that road without the partnership with um, MDOT. Um, in order to make changes on an MDOT road, they require a traffic study um, to have engineers look at um, if we did make any changes, how would roadway operations, how would roadway operations be impacted? Um, so MDOT did a traffic study and looked at the Grand River Corridor. They looked at it from a, both a three lane perspective. So that means a single lane driving in each direction and a center turn lane, which the planning study had showed the community had interest in and also a five lane section, which means that there are two lanes headed in each direction and a center turn lane. At the end of that study, um, MDOT did reveal um, that the five lane cross section, two lanes in each direction and one lane, a center turn lane was going to be required for the amount of traffic um, that Grand River currently sees to keep up uh, with uh, operations across the board for, um, for vehicles and for transit. Um, they ran the models, including bike lanes and, and street parking, so that we really had a full picture of, of what that would look like. Um, they also reviewed traffic signals and crossing opportunities because, again, that was something that the community pointed out as really important during the planning process. Next slide. So with that, we um, negotiated a partnership with MDOT to have an investment put into Grand River between Southfield and Berg Road, which is where you know the project exists today. There are going to be two nodes that were um, selected through that planning process that were going to receive a bit of a higher level of investment, what we call more streetscapes, which is just 
furnishings and different crossings and things of that sort. And those two nodes were selected based on a retail study saying that that's where development would likely occur first. Um, and the first node being the uh, Lasser and Grand River area, and then the second node being the Outer Drive and Grand River area. Uh, the total project cost for the roadway alone was $8 million. The state contributed $7 million to the project and the city contributed one. At the same time this project was going on, as many of you are aware, DWSD was also doing a water main upgrade uh, and we were able to fold that into the construction. So it makes it a larger construction project, right? Um, because there's now all this underground work that's happening, but then we only had to put the community through that process once as opposed to doing the, the underground at first and then coming back and doing the road, making it a longer period of time. So MDOT worked with us for some, um, some creative uh, project management and uh, project bidding for this work. Next slide. So what did the design process look like? So again, Michelle talked about the planning process where people were able to talk about a lot of desires and a lot of needs. They were able to give some ideas and they came up with some concepts. But when we talk about roads and road infrastructure, there's an engineering process that all projects have to go through so that we can really take a good look at what the posted speed limit is, how wide the lanes are, how many lanes we need, where the parking should be, where a bike facility could go, what kind of transit needs are there, where crossings might, where we might be able to add crossings. So we started this process um, and we had five large scale community meetings before construction started, but then we also had a number of stakeholder meetings in between those to talk with businesses that are like right along the corridor, different neighborhood block clubs and things like that. But we had five large scale meetings in which we talked about different details during each of those until we finally put together an entire engineered project. Construction started in 2019 and was going to be split over two years. Um, and we awarded the contract to Major Cement, who is a um, Detroit headquartered company. Next slide. Again, during that community feedback, we heard very similar things that Michelle mentioned earlier about Grand River, that they needed a, Grand River needs additional pedestrian crossings. For those of you that don't know, Detroit consistently ranks in um, the top five for big cities in the United States that have the most pedestrian fatalities. So the most car hitting and killing pedestrians amongst big cities. So more pedestrian crossings were needed. Um, though a lot of those accidents happen when folks are trying to transfer a bus or if somebody parks on one side of the street and their destinations on the other side and they try to run for it because there's not a crosswalk nearby. So one of the big things that was asked for was additional pedestrian crossings. People wanted to see some streetscape amenities. They wanted some benches and additional trash cans and some plantings. Um, parking was absolutely one of the top things that was requested that we must maintain parking on both sides of the street. And then uh, landscaping here, I, I just mentioned as well, but to try and green the corridor, bring in some additional trees um, and other plantings. Next slide. So let's talk about the design. So through all of those processes, again, we built in little pieces that the community asked for um, through the design. So previously on Grand River, as many of you know, there were, um, there were seven to nine lanes, depending on how you looked at it. We had a kind of a strange park, maybe sometimes drive, other times lane. Um, we have a lot of speeding and a lot of car crashes. So this was the, the section that we came up to. So section just means how we broke the road up. Um, so currently you still have parking on both sides of the street, a drive, two drive lanes in each direction and a center turn lane. Then there's a two way bike facility on um, the northern curb, if you will, um, for, for bikes. We also put in what are called mid block pedestrian crossings, which are those islands in the middle that are attached to a crosswalk so that um, people can make it across two lanes of traffic, then look the other way in a safe spot and make it across the next two lanes of traffic. This is particularly important for children and elderly that may not be fast enough to make it across the full street in one, in one swoop. Next slide. 
So this just goes into a little bit more detail at the street level of what that looks like. One of the really great things about it is that it reduces the crossing distance. So before you had to get all the way from one side of the street to the other. Now you have this um, either center refuge island that you can wait at or there are um, a refuge islands closer to um, closer to the bike lane so that once you get across that bike lane, you now only have a, a much shorter distance to cross to get to the other side. Next slide. We also put in what are called transit islands, and these are great for not only transit operations, it allows for the bus driver to not have to attempt to move in and out of traffic. They stop for a much shorter period of time. They let people get on, let people get off, and are able to move along. Um, so it helps with bus operations, but it also really helps with ADA accessibility. We frequently have situations in Detroit where the bus can't pull all the way to the curb because people are parked there um, or the space is too tight. And then the sidewalk is also quite narrow. And by the time they let down their ADA ramp in order to let on a wheelchair, there's not enough room for that individual in a wheelchair to maneuver to get onto the bus. So these islands are built with certain dimensions that allow for that bus's ramp to come down all the way to allow for a wheelchair to move maneuver around the ramp and get onto the bus in a much safer and more timely fashion than they were able to do previously. And that's what these um, bus islands look like. Next slide. Through the design, we also were able to get in additional crossing opportunities. So what we have highlighted on this slide here, each of those kind of green blue lines um, is an existing signalized intersection. Then if you go to the next slide, and this is showing in red all of the additional locations that we were able to get in, again, for those crossing opportunities for safer chances of pedestrians making it across the street, um, which only supports not only the community and people trying to use the corridor, but also the businesses, again, making it feasible for someone to park on one side of the street and safely get to a business on the other side of the street. Next slide. One of the big things that came out of the project that was a desire of the community was a signal at Grandland. We heard it again and again and again that people did not feel safe coming in and out of the driveway at Grandland and or trying to cross the street to go to the CVS pharmacy if they've already parked at Grandland. Um, through the traffic study that I mentioned earlier that MDOT was a, um, that MDOT performed, it was determined from that study that this signal was not needed. But we were able to work with MDOT and to negotiate that the city would um, own and operate and maintain the signal moving forward because it was so important to the community that it be installed. So that was a big win that we were able to get um, that came directly from our community feedback. Next slide. Um, we added some new DDOT bus shelters, which um, is great. We couldn't afford them at all bus stops, and I, I, I certainly hope that we will add more going into the future. Um, but these new bus shelters, they have solar panels on top, which offers night lighting inside. If you've um, driven past them or if you've been in the shelter, it's very nice, especially in the winter months when it gets dark much earlier, or if you're a late shift worker, that now you can wait inside a, a lit up um, bus stop. They also have USB ports that you can charge your cell phone while waiting for the bus. So they're nice new amenities um, that weren't provided in previous versions of DDOT shelters. Next slide. This is the furnishing package that you'll see out there. There are bike racks, uh, benches, and trash cans um, that have been include, included um, in certain places along the corridor. Again, we hope that we can start to offer these things on more streets throughout District 1, but we were able to have a start here. Next slide. Um, you will see in certain areas that there are these tree pits in ground, which helps again for that eight to maintain ADA accessibility. They're flat and smooth to the ground, but they allow for water and light to get into those tree roots so that those trees um, have a better chance of surviving for a longer period of time. Next slide. So today, what does it look like? Um, here is a picture of one of those mid-block crossings. Uh, if you've been out there, you're familiar with what they look like. Um, but what does this do? It is, um, you hit the button, it flashes and lets dri drivers know you want to cross the street. You 
get to look in only one direction to make sure that traffic is clear. You can cross the street, wait in the middle, then look in the other direction when traffic is clear, again, cross the street. These are crossing opportunities that weren't there before, and you just had to try and run across the street um, and or walk uh, up to a half mile out of uh, the way so you could get to a, a signal to cross. Next slide. Uh, this again is another one of those of those uh, a different crossing in a different location, but another mid block crossing next slide. The cycle track um, that is out there again, this is a two way bike facility, there were um, a couple different uh, bike clubs that showed up to our, our public comment meetings. Um, that asked for a bike facility on Grand River in particular, this happens to take two way traffic you see them elsewhere in the city, we have them installed. Um, the green paint out there for anybody that doesn't know what the green paint means, that means that it's a place where you could have conflict. So that means it's a place where a car might be or a bike might be and both of you need to be aware. A bike needs to know that they're approaching a place where a car might be and then a car also maybe crossing into that area needs to know to look for a cyclist before pulling out. So that green paint always means look. If you're on a bike, it means look for cars. If you're in a car, it means look for a bike. Next slide. Again, this is that transit island. I already explained kind of how it functions, but again, it's to improve the bus operations and then to take care of our transit riders and make sure that everybody of all abilities is able to get on and off um, the bus efficiently and have a safe place to wait for the bus. Next slide. Um, here's just the, the bus island um, and all the furnishings in action, a gentleman waiting for the bus inside one of the new shelters with the new bike racks and the trash can in front of the new uh, Obama building development. So um, next slide. I was also asked to briefly give an, uh, an update on the Grand Parklet. Um, this is a project um, that is at the intersection of Grand River, Plainview, and Puritan, or what used to be the intersection of Grand River, Plainview, and Puritan. Um, one of the complaints that we heard from residents on Puritan was that people just used um, their street as a cut through from Grand River to Outer Drive to avoid waiting at the signal, and that really frustrated them, and they felt they did it quickly, and they were speeding, um, and they asked if we could do something about that. We also heard from a number of people that it was very confusing as to if you're going to make the turn onto either Puritan or Plainview, um, that it was confusing which street led where, there was a little concrete island, and the, the intersection overall got a lot of complaints. So we worked with our, our partners at the General Services Department who oversees the city's parks, and they determined that this is what they call a park desert, an area that doesn't have a green space or a community space within easy walking distance, and that they thought that we could build out a small plaza like park. Um, that could offer the community lots of programming opportunities also a lot of uh, some green space. Um, and then it would become an official city park. So what we did here is we closed off the leg of um, Puritan, where Puritan meets Grand River. So now you only have Plainview meeting Grand River. And if you want to get to Puritan, you can, but you have to turn on to Plainview and then go down and turn to, to Puritan. Um, the top is looking down a bird's eye view of what that park will look like. The bottom is a rendering of, um, of once that park is complete, what that will look like. Um, so again, where this is, it's um, across the street um, from uh, the Grand River Development um, Corporation and Cuts Lounge um, and the gas stations, kind of where they all come into play there. And um, again, it's going to be a uh, community space we built in um, so that you could have food truck events or community yoga or just a meetup opportunity. Um, and it will be a really just beautiful space for the community. Next slide. This is what it currently looks like. You can see the Cuts Lounge, uh, the famous Cuts Lounge si sign in the back there. Um, this is what it currently looks like. It's under construction, uh, but this will, this community space will be complete um, in June, if not July of this year. You may see our crews out there getting active once again, uh, probably in the next uh, two to three weeks here as the weather warms up. Next slide. 
So I know that that was a lot of information and I think I'm going to, I'm supposed to be kicking it to Keith Hutchings right now, but um, Michelle and I are both um, gonna stay on in order to answer any questions. We also have our partners, again at MDOT, this is an MDOT road um, that Councilman Tate interview, or introduced earlier and they will be here as well. Um, but thank you for, for listening to all of that information. So um, yeah. Director Hutchings. Well, thank you, uh, Deputy oh. Director. No, no worries. I appreciate the uh, uh, all that great information. I just wanted to let folks know that you will have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, if you are uh, watching by Zoom, if you're on, uh, if you're participating by Zoom, rather, if you're on the telephone, you can participate and raise your hand to ask the question by dialing star nine. If you're on the computer and you have a Windows computer, you can dial Alt plus Y. You type those two, um, hit those two keys, and you can raise your hand. If you're on an Apple computer, it is Option plus Y. Again, if you're on the phone, it's Star Nine, and your time will be able to, uh, your time to speak will be coming up very shortly. Uh, if you're on a Windows computer, it's Alt plus Y. If you're on an Apple computer, it is Option plus Y. All right. So, Mr. Hutchins, thank you as well for joining us today. Uh, uh, there were, uh, we actually just saw a question in the chat. Someone just asked about well, wait, what's going on with all these people parking in the bike lanes. So uh, we know we have a situation where as it relates to the education of, uh, of motorists uh, about where and how to park around these protected bike lanes, but we also uh, have to deal with some enforcement in, in some capacity at some point. Uh, I personally believe that we have to do the education first but we also have to make sure that that enforcement is backed up in the event that uh, we have folks who just don't want to uh, participate in the way that we need them to participate um, as a, a resident and as a uh, customer. So talk to us about, if, if you will, uh, about what, what does enforcement and education, uh, educating the, the, the public, the motorists look like regarding these bike lanes? Sure, and I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, help share with the citizens who want to understand better um, these designs and how they can safely and legally park and understand um, how the designs were uh, created, how they come about. Um, Department of Public Works, is, along with MDOT, did a, a really extensive job trying to make sure that this new design was communicated. They, they engaged, as Caitlin just walked you through, um, significantly with the community to understand what their desires and, and, and wants were to what, uh, to what the, the new streetscape would look like. And it is a little bit challenging for people because this is a little bit uh, a different streetscape design than, especially as it relates to bike lanes, than what we've historically seen um, and, and with floating parking. And, and while it may seem different, it actually is a safer reality for those who are biking uh, and I'm, a, I, I'm an avid uh, bi uh, bicycler myself, and it, is, uh, it can be very dangerous with the traditional bike lane. So this is safer for those who are biking. Um, the challenge is some, for some people, they don't quite understand um, uh, where they can drive, where they can park, and, and, and the bike lanes someplace, are, are, those two lane bike lanes are wide enough that some people actually think they can park. But I think what DPW and M MDOT have done in these designs versus their original um, designs, they've made it really clear what a bike lane looks like versus it just being a, 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 a narrow lane. So visually, um, it is a lot easier to understand. Uh, what, and they've done some education in the past when we've had the staff, although typically that's not a function of municipal parking, but we did wanna support um, MDOT and the Department of Public Works. We have tried to support when we had some extra staff capability in educating the citizens and business owners of how this new streetscape parking design is meant to be used. And, and when we can, we will always continue to do that. In terms of enforcement, as you know, we, don't, we, we have not installed any parking meters there because we don't think the, the, the need for turns is, is yet developed to, uh, to a, a point where that makes uh, sense and where that's necessary. Um, at some point, if we see the traffic building up on street uh, so to a point where it's just not adequate parking, then we maybe would consider putting parking meters in there to encourage the turns, but we're not at that point and I don't see that occurring in the next few years. Um, the other side of it is as it relates to enforcement, we don't do a lot in the area. 
because for the most part, compliance is pretty good. However, we may have to look at uh, possibly uh, beginning to enforce at some part, point the bike lanes, if, if we see that bike lanes are not being um, are parked on it properly. But in general, we don't spend a lot of time in that area because the compliance is pretty good. Uh, but for the most part, um, we don't enforce unnecessarily because we, we, because we don't wanna add added stress to, to people unnecessarily. We only will enforce if we really think there's a need, a safety need and a need to create turns to support economically those businesses. And if we see traffic pushing into neighborhoods causing other problems with, with neighborhoods as it relates to that traffic uh, parking activity. So director, what, what, what exactly would be that threshold though? Because I mean, we are seeing people parking in the bike lanes. We see that quite often. What is what is that threshold uh, if, if we are already are seeing it right now and it's about to get warm. So you know, uh, you got folks, we created the bike lanes for people to be able to use them. And if you have vehicles blocking those bike lanes, What's that recourse that we have if, if that's taking place and we're not enforcing? So there, there is not a magical number. If we see that it, that's a problem and anybody has any concerns, we can start to, to begin to enforce that. I think uh, one of the best things to do is to see if there can be some type of partnership to create some education for a week or so before um, enforcement occurs. Um, there is no rule that says that has to occur because it's, it's marked properly. But it, it is ideal uh, to, to encourage people to understand before we begin to enforce. Um, the, the reality is, while we don't always like enforcement, the best designs are, are, will, will typically not be adhered, adhered to when there's pressure for them to be adhered to without enforcement. But if, if we can begin to talk with DPW and look at uh, what, uh, what ways they think that they can uh, support additional education, and if we can supplement them, uh, and it's a little tough on us right now because we're at about 75% furlough of our staff, so we don't really have extra people. But it, it, as we bring them back online, we may be able to be in a position to try to support um, um, the, the Department of Public Works, and then we would we could uh, give a date that we would start to enforce those bike lanes. Thank you, Director. And, uh, uh, folks from MDI, we're coming to you. I promise, but we just. Mr. Hutchins uh, can't stay today, so we want to make sure we knock out the questions for him right now. But so we're still talking about parking. Uh, Deputy Director Marcon, I mean, is, is there any, and, and maybe even uh, Michelle, I don't, again, want to put all this on the Municipal Parking Department because that's not fair. Um, they are very good at writing tickets, but we have a whole city of uh, departments that have the ability to come up with the education of uh, to, to be able to educate the uh, 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 drivers, the motors. How do we get to that point where we, we get there? Yeah, Councilman Tate, I'll take that question. It's, it's a great question. And, and it is on the responsibility of all of us. The education piece um, goes across departments. And so um, for Grand River in particular, we're in the process right now of getting approvals from MDOT to put up some temporary signage through the warmer months. Um, that is a small placard in the buffer that says you park on this side, you ride a bike on this side to make sure that as you're pulling into that parking lane, you know where you should be. Um, so that's that's one of the things that we've had really good luck on. Um, you may have seen them last summer uh, along Spinoza and Rouge Park. We also used them along Michigan Avenue and Jefferson at, at various moments. But um, we're working with MDOT right now to get approvals to use those signs. MDOT also partnered with us on an educational flyer um, that we did print and we, we did some distribution along the corridor. I think we can do a lot more of that. Um, also, DPW, through our own social media uh, channels, we've been putting together kind of pictures of the Grand River streetscape and then some informational graphics of how that, that, that should be used. And so we're trying to push it out through social media as well. Um, that is not to say that we can't do more. We can always do more. Um, and so hopefully um, we'll be able to work with municipal parking um, in, in the near future as staff becomes available. And again, do some of that additional boots on the ground outreach that they were able to offer us in previous, um, in previous pilot projects. But um, you're absolutely right that it's not one department's responsibility and that we're all in it. Right, and thank you for that because we haven't really seen it because we love to push out information from our office, especially uh, with items concerning the uh, the district. So we look forward to 
receiving the pack if you have the package or, or however we get it, but we want to push that out ASAP. And uh, Deputy Director, I, I, I'm glad you did mention MDOT because we went through this whole uh, program thus far, this forum, without speaking to MDOT. And don't know if you have anything in particular, uh, Mr. Uh, Asoff and Mr. Adesso, if you have anything that you want to add or uh, do you just want to open up for a question? The floor is yours if you, if you do. Hello, yeah, the name is Kea Defe, so I really, um, uh, on behalf of my organization, MDOT, um, we really enjoy the partnership that we've had with the City of Detroit uh, Department of uh, Public Works on this project. Um, actually, this is one of the kind of projects that we look forward to in terms of partnership, seizing the opportunity to actually um, put together a project that both benefits the community, benefits the department in terms of programming and time, and at the same time, we are able to help with the economic benefit and uh, for the community in terms of revitalization of an area. So really, the partnership is being a win-win on both sides. Um, it's, 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 it's one of those things that, that, that give us uh, the pleasure of the kind of work that we do when we see how we can actually improve an area, not only on the, on the roadway aspect, but also the economic component that has also added to it and improve quality of life as well as we see with the with the bike path and also the improvements on the on the various mid mid ball crossing that we're able to install. Um, so with that with that sense, hopefully um, some of the things that we'd like to talk about will come through the through the questions that I'm sure that would, that is already out there. Uh, maybe we can answer some of them as we move on. Emil, do you have anything you want to add? I think, I don't know if his computer may have frozen. All right, yes, he may have frozen. He's frozen a little bit. All right, but we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can bring him back up. Uh, Mr. Hutchins, I know you indicated that you had a uh, time constraint. Do you have a couple of minutes or do you have to leave now? I do, I do have a couple of minutes. I okay. was also had a few of the, 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 uh, the comments and, it, and then what I'm reading is that there's a pressing need uh, for enforcement. And obviously, we could start tomorrow, but that's not what I would necessarily um, uh, do unless that's what the, the citizens are asking. But maybe between your office, the, um, the Department of Neighborhoods, and DPW, we could um, immediately begin to talk with the, 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 uh, business, the business owners and, and have them begin to alert uh, consumers, customers, that we're going to enforce and maybe give it about a week. And then we can start to uh, go out and enforce in that area because it looks like there's some immediate need that there's significant problems with the bicycle lanes. So if, if that's what is desired, we can, we can do the enforcement, but I would like to at least have someone reach out to the business owners and let them know they're, they're uh, inform their customers um, that we are going to start to enforce it. Right. Okay, so with that being said, we're now at uh, 6.39. We're gonna to go to questions. Um, let's go first to Zoom, Yelena. Let's go to questions. Again, if folks have questions, you have the ability to raise your hand and we'll make sure that we get your questions responded today. And we're also gonna to go to Facebook because we're um, broadcasting simultaneously there as well. Uh, so if folks have questions there, we will be asking them as well. So Yelena? You're up, who do we have first? Good evening, Councilman. We have Marguerite Scarlett. Marguerite, uh, how are you? We're good. Um, my question is in the chat. Your question's in the chat? Yes. All right. Uh, Let's see. Okay, all right. So she says some people are not obeying the law, the rules of laws. Uh, she used to ride her bike over the city at bus stops. It can be dangerous for people with disabilities, and and for others as well. That that's the one you wanted me to read, correct, uh, Miss Maddox? I believe so. I just looked at her hand. 
Yeah, that's the one we see there. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about the, the safeguards that we have for uh, residents with disabilities. Great, thank you so much for that question, uh, Marguerite. Um, that she is correct in that, you know, anytime you have multiple modes coming together, there is a chance for conflict. And there is a part of everything that is doing your, your job as a citizen and looking out for the most vulnerable user on the road. Um, and so that would be the individual or, um, with disabilities. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we put in extra safeguards. And we also wanna make sure though that motorists and um, bike riders and just able-bodied pedestrians are making sure that they are looking out for other users that might be on the road as well. In this particular case, again, we built the, the ADA accessible transit islands. Um, and they, those do offer, again, a, a separated isolated space in order to wait for, um, for the bus. Um, there's also leading up to that, there is notification for the cyclists, again, in, in green paint and, um, and a crosswalk, a pedestrian crosswalk showing where somebody would be crossing from the sidewalk to the transit island. And those cyclists should yield to any, um, any transit rider or pedestrian that is going to get onto the bus. Um, again, if somebody is parked in the bike lane, and I have seen on Grand River, somebody wedged between the transit island and the curb, um, that is, again, uh, we're going to rely on people. And I, and I do understand some of the new infrastructure is just generally confusing, but we also know that some people know where they shouldn't be parking um, and they're doing it anyways. And so again, it comes back to Detroiters looking out for Detroiters. And um, it's one of the big things we're trying to push as a city right now is for roadway safety and looking out for the most vulnerable user. Um, so a great question. We built in a lot of infrastructure to help um, but we do need citizens to pay attention to that infrastructure, the signage, the markings, and know what they should be looking for when they're out there as well. Gotcha. Thank you. Elena, we have another question. Yes, we have Trajan Centers. All right. Trajan Centers, thank you for joining us. Um, for sure. Hi. Thanks for having me. I uh, am a huge supporter of the streetscape improvements. I really love everything that's happened. Uh, but there's one issue that I've noticed with the traffic light at Grand River and Westbrook turning left into Meyer. if you're traveling north on Grand River, where uh, almost daily, uh, usually at rush hour times when people are going to the grocery store, there's no left turn signal, say, uh, safe green left turn signal to turn into Meyer, And as a result, traffic often backs up to the traffic island at Westbrook and then back into one of the uh, travel lanes on Grand River. So it, it effectively cuts Grand River down to one lane of traffic uh, on the right moving through and, and uh, causes kind of a jam there. So uh, I'm just wondering if that uh, if there are any changes potentially or studies to that light that may be uh, coming down the pipeline to try and improve traffic at that intersection. Thank you. And anyone feel free to answer who has the... Okay, so I can answer this. The, uh, <clears throat> the left turn signal has a detection uh, radar at the signal and it's uh, designed to allow multiple cars and to stay green uh, up to a degree because we don't want, at one point it has to yield to the traffic coming and coming on Grand River. Uh, with that said, if you have like a long line of customers want to turn to Myers, customers who are waiting in Grand River should not wait uh, for a long period of time will create a traffic jam. So we looked into that and uh, we are assessing it now. The as it is now, we uh, the maximum allowable guidelines for left turn is the signal was set up for. But uh, we received feedback from uh, few citizens, and we are looking into it right now to see how much we can add few seconds of green turning into Meyer so people don't have to cut uh, to cut. Uh, especially during rush hour. Thank you. Elaine, who do we have next? We have uh, Commissioner Brown. 
Commissioner Brown, good evening. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours, sir. Hey, good evening, uh, Councilman. Thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions. One was, was the enforcement issue. Um, one of the biggest issues that uh, talking with the uh, MPOs in the area is that there's no signage there telling people that they can't park. Um, whose responsibility is that, even though we know it's a common sense issue, but they need to have signage there that they can enforce it. And then what are we doing about the uh, parking enforcement being out here? And my other question is, what about maintenance on the, the scapes and everything now? Because as I'm looking at now, the curbs are fading, uh, the paint is chipping off the streets and things like that. Is there any plan to maintain that and dollars to maintain that and keep it looking beautiful? Thank you for the question, Commissioner Brown. I'm gonna take the first part of your question and then I'm gonna kick it to MDOT for uh, maintenance of striping. But um, the first part of your question uh, having to do with the parking, um, the guidance and the signage for parking. Um, I had mentioned earlier that we're going to be deploying some temporary signs um, with the permission of MDOT this, this summer um, that will say parking on this side, bikes on this side. Um, there are appropriate pavement markings that would be in your, the, the long name of it is the Michigan Municipal Uniform Traffic Devices Manual. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, the, um, the, the, the markings that are out there do legally tell a driver uh, where driving space is, where parking spaces are, and where bike uh, space is. Um, again, I think that the community deserves more education around that. And that's why we're going to be deploying extra, extra tools in the toolbox this summer um, or spring summer, I should say. Um, but I, I do just wanna say that the markings that are out there are appropriate legal markings to designate where driving spaces, um, where parking spaces and where bike spaces. And then before I kick it to MDOT, I'm gonna touch on a maintenance piece that falls on the city. Um, the, the city's general services department will be maintaining um, the grand parklet that, that I, I talked about briefly that will be um, under construction this season and finishing this summer. Um, they will be taking on the maintenance of that space. And then the bike lane itself in terms of sweeping and snow removal, although hopefully we don't get any more snow this year, um, the bike lane itself will also fall on the Department of Public Works to, uh, to be maintaining that piece. Um, but as far as the general striping of the road and the crosswalks that you mentioned are, are chipping, um, I'm going to let MDOT talk about their maintenance program for those things. Our uh, pavement striping contractor will come back when the weather permits and we will fix all the faded, chip, uh, missing uh, striping. So sometimes when the weather permit in the summer, uh, striping as for those who don't know, requires uh, certain temperature and certain weather conditions. And once the conditions are uh, suitable, we will, the contractor will come through the project and will fix all the missing chip faded uh, stripe. All right, thank you for that. So, so are we saying that there's a regular annual schedule to uh, maintain, maintain the, uh, the striping and the the, 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 the paint on the, 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 the ground? I mean, what's the frequency are we talking about? Annually or so, as um, needed? M MDOT has on all its, uh, all its trunk line, we do have high annual. Um, uh, every other year we do um, do striping contract throughout the, throughout the, uh, the region. So this, this roadway will be in the, it will be in the template as well, whereby at some point uh, in the, let's say, Everything is completed for this year, and in about two years, we'll come back doing striping through that corridor all over again. So it's normally what MDOT does on all its roadway anyway. All right, and Deputy Director, I know that we had some 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 challenges uh, as it relates to the snow removal and the most recent snow in the bike lanes. I called the director because I started receiving calls as well. Let's just tell the folks what happened. You know, why did it take us a while to get the uh, snow removed and the ice removed from the bike lanes? In the most recent uh, snowfall, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, it was it was uh, a misunderstanding, miscommunication. Um, so they're new, they're new lanes. 
our maintenance crews have not had to, to go out to Grand River with, with the bike facility uh, maintenance vehicles um, until this year. And so it wasn't on their radar. And uh, we didn't share the information that yes, Grand River is a state trunk line, but it's gonna be a city responsibility to maintain these bike lanes. Um, so apologies all around for, for the issue and that occurred. We did eventually get out there and get them cleared. Um, that will be on the regular maintenance schedule for bike lanes in the city moving forward. And the bike lanes should be cleared uh, in a much more timely fashion than they were this last big snow. All right, thank you. We're going to Facebook next. Aisha, what's our, who's our first question? What's our first question on Facebook, ma'am? Our first question on Facebook is from Tracy Monica Martin, who asks, will there be pedestrian scrambles with all-way vehicle stops? Pedestrian scrambles, that's a new one for me. Anybody, what's a, for those of us who don't know what a pedestrian scramble is, what's that? So a pedestrian scramble is an intersection where all vehicle lights turn red at once. So there's no cars moving, east or west, north or south and all pedestrian lights turn green so that people can walk diagonal across the intersection um, or in any, any direction that they choose. Um, those are really, um, they're useful in, in areas where you have really high pedestrian activity, um, where you need to get a mass amount of pedestrians across an intersection at once and that they all might be going in different areas. You'll see them frequently um, we don't have any in Detroit yet, but um, you'd see them frequently in the New York cities and the Chicago's uh, of the world. So um, that is what a pedestrian scramble is. Uh, there are no plans to install a pedestrian scramble um, through this section on Grand River. I hope maybe one day we'll have that type of pedestrian activity where we can discuss it. Um, but we're talking about hundreds of pedestrians trying to get across an intersection at once um, to, a, to enact something like that. God, I'm glad and I've, I've seen it in video, especially in Asian countries and over in Europe, just never knew it was called pedestrian scramble. That's now part of my lexicon. I'm gonna keep there that. you go. <laughs> uh, Aisha, who else do we have on uh, Facebook? David Leg asks, um, this is not really a question, more so a comment um, and concern. There have been several new items destroyed, bus shelter and bike rack at Evergreen Mid-Island Signal at Piedmont, trash cans at the Halen sign at the First Island westbound at CBS. Yeah, I know I've called in the, uh, the obliterated bus stop, uh, the, uh, the, the bus rest area uh, at Evergreen and Grand River. Uh, we've got glass shards that are still on the ground. And I guess folks are trying to figure out whose responsibility it is to to either uh, pick that stuff up and replace it or whatever that next move is, but just trying to figure out why does it take so long to get something like that removed? And then also, if you can please respond to the rest of the question that the individual had. So I'm going to take a, a small piece of that and then I will kick it to MDOT. Um, the bus shelter itself, it would be the responsibility of DDOT um, to go out and replace. I did see that email come across my inbox. Um, DPW is going to go out and sweep for the glass that's there. Um, but the bus shelter replacement itself is um, is a DDOT asset and DDOT will will be the one to have to go out and replace that. Um, and it has been it has been reported to DDOT um, um, in the same email that I saw. Um, in terms of general, you know, if signs are knocked down or signal signal um, arms are hit or whatever it might be, that would be that would be MDOT. And so I'm going to kick it to MDOT to answer that part. Yeah, these all will be repaired and replaced. However, there is a lead time to repair a signal. The, the, um, for the bus shelter that got hit at Walgreen so you guys to know there's six months lead to order a bus shelter. They are not available on demand to go and buy them. The contractor has to place an order, uh, put a deposit, and then the manufacturer takes six months to deliver. So the, with that said, the shelter was hit back in December. So we are so expected to get it in May and we'll install it. Same with the signs, the uh, pedestrian sign at uh, right past Lasser going west got hit and we just placed an order. Also, there are six to eight weeks lead time to receive the signal. Uh, same with the signage. So we try to keep up every time 
we get a report, uh, a sign is hit or a traffic signal is damaged or any uh, anything needs repair, we get on it right away. However, the citizens don't notice it immediately because of the lead time. But they, they all will be repaired and the, before we close the job, we'll make sure they all repaired and good uh, in good shape. After that, our signals and our infrastructure will be turned to our maintenance department who also will take over. If there's any maintenance or repair needed after that will be the maintenance department. Thank you for that. Uh, so we'll go to Zoom now. Uh, Yelena, who's our next call? We have Ms. Irma Leapart. Irma Leapart, thank you for joining us. Floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you, Councilman. Um, good evening, everyone. So um, I think the design uh, it was well done. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's spaces to park, bikes, uh, you know, bike lanes, benches, trash cans, et cetera. These are really very nice amenities. So thank you, job well done on that. Uh, but I do remain concerned that MDOT did not consider implementing green stormwater infrastructure to manage stormwater runoff, keeping it out of the combined sewer system. Uh, we talked about it, I felt extensively um, in the planning phase of the project and was felt like I was led to believe that this was a possibility. Um, Grand River, this section of Grand River is within the Rouge watershed. And as you may know, uh, the Rouge is uh, unfortunately has quite a few overflows of sewage and stormwater during heavy rain events. So having, uh, managing stormwater on Grand River would have been really a big asset, uh, an important thing to add to this project. And you know we know it's possible because we see what's been done on Livernois. Um, so green streets are not foreign to us. So I'm wondering, you know, uh, you know what's, what's, what's the possibility of uh, having that uh, implemented in the future? on Grand River or what is your stance for other MDOT roads in the city? Can it be done? I am going to, I'm going to um, just answer a part of that and then I'll let MDOT finish. First of all, Miss Lee Part, <laughs> I always love seeing you come on and ask questions. I know exactly what the question is going to be, but I love that you stay after us for being, um, for getting greener and better in our design. So first of all, there's great appreciation for that. And thank you, thank you for the question. It was brought up multiple times, not only during the PDD, um, the PDD uh, process, but then also through the DPW design process, it was requested. Um, I, I will only say, and I will let MDOT give, give their response as well, um, that it becomes very complicated on a road like Grand River, um, where the assets underneath the ground that would obviously the sewer and water is City of Detroit DWSD. Um, the sidewalks are kind of a DPW maintenance area, but the stormwater runoff from the road is a DP or a, uh, an MDOT asset. Um, so I will let MDOT talk about if they have any greening road um, um, policies or projects um, that they are looking to implement. Uh, but it wasn't feasible on this project because we just couldn't um, get all of those uh, all of those agreements in place. Uh, you brought up Livernois. It was possible on Livernois. Livernois is a city road, um, so all agencies, um, you know, were able to to come together on that one. But um, I, I'll let MDOT talk about their green stormwater. But even though we weren't all allowed for it to happen, please don't stop asking for it. So. Yeah, I really appreciate the, that question. Actually, um, for MDOT, we actually look into that in a lot of the projects that we do when the opportunity uh, affords itself. In this particular case, from what I understand um, um, in the development process and in the stakeholder engagement, there's not, there's not, uh, we didn't have enough flexibility to be able to do that. Um, bearing, in, bearing in mind that a number of these uh, infrastructure are uh, really maintained and owned by different agencies at this particular, uh, in this particular case. But as far as MDOT is concerned on our projects, we do look into that when the opportunities affords us. So really in the city of Detroit, um, right now in terms of the projects that we do have, I know there are a number of things that we, we are discussing on the I-94 projects um, um, in terms of how we capture uh, stormwater and, and 
even on, but most of this typically will be able, we are able to do this when we are doing construction projects whereby we are really reworking everything. Most of the time when we are doing rehab, we are most of, the, uh, we are typically not affecting the stormwater design. So as a result, it's difficult to really um, extend the scope of project of the project to that. But when we have a reconstruction opportunity, that affords us an opportunity to be able to act and to address many of these issues that are really have to be dealt with at the at the beginning of any project or a, typically a four-hour project, a, a reconstruction project. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Yelena, who do we have next? Uh, we do not have any more hands raised. Um, what we'll do is we'll pop over to Facebook because I believe Aisha indicated we do have some over there. Yep. Um, the next question we have on Facebook is from Pam Weinstein, who asks, is it possible for MDOT to add additional speed limit signs on Grand River? To my knowledge, there is only one at Piedmont and Grand River on the eastbound side. Yeah, we go ahead, Kay. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I think this is something that came up before in conversation. And I think uh, we already looked into that, or perhaps we can further look into that if there's an opportunity for areas that were rents, um, additional sign, um, speed limit sign. Uh, we'll look into that and we'll be discussing with our traffic and safety um, engineers in the office. Okay. We'll take a note of that. What, what, what's the, again, I always like to give folks an idea of what that threshold is. What's, what is the threshold? You know, is, is it X amount of cars that you see driving faster than the limit? Or how do you make that determination? How do the engineers make that determination, surveyors? Uh, do you, you mean in terms of uh, speed? Right. Yeah, to no, to increase, I'm sorry, to increase the uh, number of signs, the increase the number of signage. Well, I mean, there, there are a number of things that we look into in terms of the placement. Of course, there are other, other kind of signs in the roadway as well. Sometimes uh, if, you, if you have too many, too many um, signs out there, I mean, it becomes a, a nuisance to the drivers as well, so they don't pay attention to anything. So, but in, in this particular case, um, there are criteria that we set based on the speed limit that we are, we are um, the speed limit in that roadway to be able to have the number and the spacing of these signs. Um, that's what we're going to be looking at um, and then making sure that we stay within the guidelines that are there and also if there are opportunities to do that. One thing to, um, I, I think at the core of this question is probably the, 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 the question is coming from the sign that to the enforcement companies. One thing that we have not talked about in this conversation is really to really look at the pandemic components that comes at the heel of this, of this project. There are a lot of things that we were not able to do because as we are wrapping this project up, the pandemic really sets in. Um, a lot of things we, when we're talking about the enforcement, the educational aspect of it that comes after a project, especially in the, in the corridor that would change the configuration of the corridor at this level. So the educational com component is coming a little late into, into the process, but typically this will come in right at the beginning or even as the project is beginning to wrap up. So hopefully as uh, things are becoming, going back to what we'll call normal, maybe a little bit different of the normal, maybe now we can start talking about the educational components and some of the things that really, the tweaking of the project, because that's what we're really talking about when a project is done now, how is human interaction with the project that is already done? And some things will still have to be tweaked. So there's opportunity for us to really reassess that. If that means additional signs, as long as the, uh, the, the requirements and the guidelines that we have do, um, do support that, we will do that. All right, uh, Aisha. Next question is from Marsha Broom, who asks, why are the bus stops, bump outs and traffic islands built without a few inches of setbacks from the traffic lanes to reduce the chance of cars hitting the curb? This will be especially bad when there is snow on the streets and dangerous. Yeah, I was going to ask the question. I was waiting for it to come about the, the, the lanes and the bump outs being a little tighter than anticipated. I was one who supported the design, but when I actually got on the road and I saw how tight it was, that was a reality check for me. Um, you know, talk to us about that. 
So I'll take that one. Um, so first I want to mention that everything spatially is to uh, an engineering standard. You can't just go out on a road and build something any size that you want. There are, um, there are standards that engineers must follow when putting together a roadway design. So everything out there meets the Michigan code and the federal code um, uh, as efficiently you know, wide. Um, and so the, the, one of the main goals of this project was to slow people down. Um, especially coming through kind of those commercial corridors where again, we're trying to get that pedestrian activity up and that business support up. Um, anybody that lives in the city of Detroit knows that we have a particular issue with speeding. Um, and we want to make sure that we are going after it twofold. One is roadway design, making sure that our roadway design is indicating to drivers what speeds they should be going. And then the second part is enforcement. And those two things should work hand in hand. Without each of those, um, the other is not likely to work. And, and Director Hutchings mentioned that earlier. Um, and so the lanes that were out there before the Streetscape project, they were wider than what they are now. The lanes that are out there now, again, are an industry standard size, um, but they are narrower. And so hopefully as a driver, that causes you to want to go a little bit slower. Um, and again, that's the point of it. Um, in terms of the bump outs and the islands, those are again designed to go with the posted speed limit. So if you are a driver going the speed limit and you happen to veer out of your lane, whether you think you're going to try and make a right turn or getting into the middle turn lane, they are designed in a way where the signs and the markings are, if you are going the speed limit, you have enough reaction time to stop before you hit those. Um, if you are speeding, if you are going faster than you should, and you veer into one of those to pass somebody or to try and make your turn, then there is a greater chance that you will not be able to stop in time before you hit those. So I want everybody to keep that in mind when we talk about these two. And the next time you're driving down Grand River, I really encourage you, look at what speed you're going and think about how you feel on that road look at where you see pedestrians, where you see someone waiting for the bus. Maybe if you see a, 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 a bike out there, think about the speed you're going and how quickly you would be able to react to all of those things if you, if you needed to stop in an emergency. Um, so we didn't set back uh, the, the pedestrian islands. They're in the center, so it's a little harder to set those back. But the bump outs or the transit islands, again, we want the transit island to meet the bus. That makes it easier for the bus that makes it easier for those entering and exiting the bus. So we didn't set those back. The bump outs, the whole point of the bump outs is to shorten the crossing time for a pedestrian trying to get across the street. So again, those are designed to make it easy for pedestrians and to tell drivers you need to slow down. There could be a pedestrian here or there could be someone waiting for the bus here. All right, thank you. Aisha, do we have anyone else on uh, Facebook? Yes, Colleen McMurney. Ags, is it possible to have better signage on the eastbound lanes near Berg Road? The road narrows from four lanes to two lanes and the signage is not clear that the lane is lost on both sides. I will let MDOT answer that one. Um, how are you, are you familiar with that location as described? Yeah, so the, uh, the road is wider past McNichols. Mm -hmm. I believe she's asking the transition but, uh, from McNichols going west and the road gets wider there and the buffer lane, the, the road consistent with two, uh, two traffic lanes in each direction and uh, center lane, but the, the buffer lane gets wider at that, uh, at that section. So it's, uh, there's no loss of a lane. Emil, I think she might be asking if you're coming at Berg, at Berg at where, Berg, at Berg. Um, yeah, at Berg where the island drops or the median drops and then you come into the section you're referring to. I think that's what the question is. Uh, okay, so we added some striping there and we could we could look into some signage. Okay. We'll follow up on that as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Aisha, next question, concern, comment, Facebook? No more questions on Facebook. All right, uh, Yelena. How about you on Zoom? Yes. yes, yes, Councilman. We have Martha. Good evening, Martha. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. 
<laughs> well, it's Mark. Mark, this is Martha's computer. Ah. <laughs> but on that, that issue with Grand River, as you're going eastbound from Telegraph, they took out a traffic light that it was at the old Redford Post Office. And I dare you to sit there with a radar gun and see anybody coming down that street doing less than 45. They are screaming through there. So, and uh, also the, the point of where the boulevard ends at Berg, there are two turn lanes, but there is no arrow signage on the pavement indicating that it's a turn lane. I've had six or seven people pass me on the left as you come out of where the boulevard ends. Okay. Any uh, any response at all? We did not take any signs down as part of this project. Well, we need to put signs up. The, the traffic light was taken down. Yeah. Not through this project. I not think that was taken project. out years ago. No, we added no, it was taken out at the beginning of this project. Uh, so in, in this particular case, I would probably want to look into it, the timeline of when it was removed and what the impact of it is to the, the new configuration, uh, the new cross-section of, uh, of um, Grand River at this particular time. So I'll take a note of that as one of the things to look at. Um, again, when I talked about earlier on that, as we, as we are wrapping up a project, there are th still things that we're going to have to tweak a little bit, and that's what is coming up over here. That how is that this new cross section re, uh, interacting with the outside limits of the project as well? So if there's an opportunity, what the community is seeing and what the drivers are seeing and what we're experiencing, this is an opportunity for us to share those, um, to share those between ourselves and look into how we can make such improvements. So this is a good this is a good one, um, and we need to look into it and see what we can do about. It. So, I, you know, we kind of talked about, we talked about a number of issues regarding the uh, streetscape, but in terms of the analysis, so how do we know, how are we going to determine if what we set out to do, we accomplished? You know, what, what time frame, what's, what are the metrics to determine success for this particular streetscape project? Especially in a city like Detroit, we want to make sure that we get a year round analysis um, to compare, you know, people drive differently and use the road differently in the winter as they do in the summer. And so we really want to get a full year of traffic collection after, um, you know, after the streetscape has been implemented. Um, you know, you talked about Livernois earlier kind of being the first streetscape out of the door, out the door. Um, we still haven't done the after analysis because Livernois just finished in 2020, and there wasn't much normal um, about 2020, especially in terms of traffic. Um, we know that there were many fewer cars on the street than, than in other years, um, but we also know there were many more pedestrians and bikers out using the facilities. Um, so it wouldn't have been an apples to apples comparison of a before and after. So we're hoping that 2021 proves to be um, slightly more normal or new normal, I hate using that, but um, than 2020 was, and we'll really be able to get a good sense of the after. But the things that we'll be looking at are speeds, traffic volumes, so did speed go up or down? Did the traffic volumes increase or decrease? In traffic volumes, I mean all traffic. Were there more riders um, on the Grand River buses? Were there more people on the sidewalks? Were there more bikers in the bike lane? Were there more cars on the road? Um, and then as well as we'll look at crash rates. Have there been more crashes? Have those crashes been more serious or less serious than they have been in the past? Have there been fa fatal crashes? Um, did those fatal crashes involve pedestrians, bicyclists, or was it a car on car fatal crash? So there's a number of things that we're gonna look at. And then also I should mention um, that we're also gonna be working with our partner departments to look at has there been increased retail activity? Have new businesses open? Have new developments come to fruition? Because um, all of those kind of play together. Um, but I would say that it, it's probably gonna be, we just finished in fall of 2020. It's probably gonna be at least until fall of 2021 where we get any type of, of real comparison that we can take a look at before and after. Um, but that's again, assuming that 2021 um, gets back to some sort of normalcy. All right. Now, I see on the chat that there is a request for 
uh, reflective paint on the curb cutouts uh, on either side of the bike lanes. Uh, so the cars exiting uh, CVS and other businesses at night don't crash into the curb cutouts. So uh, if we can please make note of that, that is also a uh, concern of the constituents. Uh, let's see here. Yelena, I think you had another question. I'm going to look at some of these comments and see if we can pull some more out. Who do we have next? What question do we have on uh, Zoom, Yelena? We have Toya. Toya, thank you for joining us. Floor is yours. I have to promote her to panelists. She's got a version of uh, Zoom that okay. can move her over. OK. Uh oh, Toya, you're on mute. How you doing? I just really had a um, basically a comment about the traffic light by the Redford Post Office. Um, same thing that um, the, the last guy that was saying about when you coming from Telegraph going back towards uh, West or the other way is just they come so fast. So maybe that can slow down some of the traffic coming into the two lanes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Yelena, who else do we have? Okay, we have uh, Chuck Sue. Chuck Reddy, the A. Thank you for joining. Hey, hi. Um, two. Uh, this is a retire. I, uh, two questions um, on the the employed app. There was part of Mel of the traffic at Grand Warwick. Um, the response uh, given the employee was the Chuck, traffic Chuck, lights over are... Hey, Chuck, you're breaking up. I'm not sure if your signal is uh, challenged, but you're breaking okay. up. Okay. Anyway, the, the signal over and uh, reported problem and that it's an problem is the way to directly report things to rather than through no, Detroit. Chuck, Chuck, I'm sorry, we can't, we, I, I can't, we can't make out what you're saying. Your your signal is breaking up. Am I the only one who's not hearing it or? I think I got that he was trying to file a complaint about the Warwick and Grand River signal um, okay. in the Improved Detroit app. But since that signal is not a Detroit signal, that the complaint needs to go to MDOT. Um, Chuck, that's all I got. So I, don't, I didn't get what the complaint was. Um, or if you're just looking for a contact at MDOT, um, I don't know if you want to try. Uh, yeah. try. The question do is there a directly this to that not go through Detroit? Yeah. I'm sorry, Chuck, we missed it. If you can chat, if you can type it into the chat, in. we will be able to get your question responded to. We're also going to make sure that at the end of this forum, we have contact information for our presenters today. So you can make sure you pass your question on if the, the question wasn't answered today. Uh, and if you have any follow-up questions as well, and that's for anyone who asks those questions and concerns. Uh, Yelena, do we have another caller? We have no more hands raised at the moment. All right, um, so I'm just gonna try to go through some of these in the, in the, the chat, because we're gonna wrap up a very shortly. Don't wanna prolong the meeting. Again, thank you all for being here. One question is about the bike lanes themselves uh, in terms of them being clean. I know we talked about the snow removal, uh, but you know, broken glass, uh, trash, whose responsibility is it to maintain the bike lanes uh, from debris, not necessarily uh, snow? Department of Public Works will be doing that. Um, we do have a sweeper um, for the bike lanes that we will use. Um, we, it's Some of it's the same machinery that we also use for plowing. So once we take the plow off the front, when we know there's no more snow coming, we'll put the sweeper on um, and be able to address some of that. Um, but it is the Department of Public Works and we do, um, we do have an annual program of bike lane sweeping. Um, but that usually picks up, uh, you know, later, a little bit later in the spring than, than right now. But I will, I will I'm going to make a note um, to make sure that there's been reports of, of issues on the Grand River bike lanes and that we need to um, pay attention to those. Thank you for that. 
And we also have, uh, Chuck did type his question in. He asked, uh, is there a way to report MDOT issues directly to MDOT without going through the Improved Detroit app? I think we kind of talked about the phone number and the email address that we're going to be offering. Yeah, we, we made uh, our information, Kay and I, are with you guys going to make it uh, available to, and please don't hesitate to contact us with any issues. Uh, if we can't answer, we, uh, we are able to communicate with our partners at the city and it's collaborative uh, work. We appreciate the partnership again. And I was cut off earlier and I wanted to say, we appreciate also the community uh, participation throughout this project because it allows us during construction to make modification, which is much easier than to do things after the fact. So I would like everybody who did talk to us from the community throughout the construction. Uh, one thing before, uh, as when you go from Berg, uh, where the road gets narrower, so I don't leave the, uh, uh, the citizen without an answer. The striping should guide with signage. There is a signage for the lane ends and the striping should guide the drivers to go into the lanes. Uh, my guess is maybe that some signs are missing or so I promise to drive it uh, soon and check if there's any signage missing or anything inappropriate, we'll make modifications right away. All right. So uh, I do have, uh, Ms. Marguerite, Matt, I, I see your question. It's not, none of the folks who are on the call right now can answer that one of your questions, but I'm gonna ask them the second one regarding the snow removal at bus stops and uh, curb cuts. In terms of priority, I know, when, especially when we have a, a heavy snowfall, uh, the priority of getting the streets clean, getting the streets clean. Where does the, the, the snow removal at the bus stops and curb cuts, where do they fall in in terms of priority following a snow event? You know, the, the bus stops themselves are handled by DDOT, so I don't have a great answer for you right now, um, Marguerite, but we, I can, um, I got notes written down here from some of the chat questions, um, and I will reach out to, to DDOT to try and get a response for that. But um, the, the snow removal from bus stops is a DDOT um, task. All right, thank you. So what we're going to do, we're going to uh, wrap up for any new questions and get the remaining questions answered. Uh, Yelena, do we have any additional questions on Zoom? We have one last hand raised and it's caller ending in 500. Caller ending in 500. The floor is yours. Thank you for joining. Yes, this is uh, Robert Patterson from uh, Gramont. Uh, as I look at the uh, lanes uh, that are available, and especially lane driving uh, against uh, the lane where parking is allowed, uh, there's really no wiggle room available there, especially if somebody uh, uh, all at once uh, at the inopportune moment opens their door. I mean, you're going to wind up taking somebody's door off. Uh, so I think that kind of configuration should be uh, looked into as a uh, looked into as as a safety issue, uh, possible loss of doors, or even even uh, mirrors. Uh, some some trucks, especially, have extended mirrors and everything else. So uh, be aware of that with the uh, the narrowness of the lanes. Thank you. Insurance. And insurance questions. <laughs> All right. well, thank you, uh, Robert, for for joining us again. Uh, and I'm sure the panelists took note of that question or its concern, comment. Uh, any other callers on Zoom, Elena? Not, uh, not at the moment. That was it for hands raised. All right, that's it for Zoom. How about on Facebook, Aisha? Any additional questions on Facebook? Yes, Carolyn Joan asks, when they were evaluating traffic signals, did they consider making a left turn signal to enter Grand River from Losser? And anyone can answer that question. This was, um, this was a comment that we heard um, uh, multiple times from, from residents in the old Redford community. The trade-off there was we would have to make modifications or we wouldn't, it would be a county request to make modifications at Losser and you wouldn't get 
um, the safer pedestrian crossing and we'd have to remove some of the parking on both sides of Lasser in order to open it up for a center turn lane. And it was determined at that time that it probably wasn't in the best benefit of the, of the community um, just to move those left turners quickly. But I will tell you that we heard it from multiple people um, of, of asking us to look at that as an option. Is, is there any possibility moving forward that it's going to be re-evaluated, you know, based um, on? So, I mean, things are things are ever ever changing. You know, traffic patterns and things of that sort. Lasser again is a, a Wayne County road. It's it's not a city of Detroit road. We only had the conversation because we were redoing that intersection. Um, but that at that time um, in Old Redford, they were hoping for more businesses to be opening and more pedestrians and, and more need for parking. And so those, th those things were prioritized over adding an extra left turn lane. Um, but, but should things you know, change um, and in the future, uh, Wayne County would be the one to, uh, to talk to. Thank you. But, uh, the, the light there is now um, there was some changes to that particular life because I remember before it was just extremely difficult to make the turn. Can you talk about what changes were made at that intersection? Um, Emil, do you want to talk about what happened at Lasser and Grand River, the changes? Yeah, that our the traffic study did uh, time the right, the lights just right where the light at McNichols, when it turns red, it will allow uh, some room for the uh, left turn traffic. So the timing of the signals was sequenced in a way where it will give some yield to the left turners and they will be able to make the left turn. All right. Aisha, anyone left on Facebook? Any other questions? No other questions on Facebook. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, all of our guests for joining us today. Uh, Caitlin Marcone, uh, Michelle Flournoy, uh, Kay Adesso, Emil Asaf, and of course, Keith Hutchins. Uh, thank you for providing information to the community. This is what folks have been asking for, and uh, you've been able to provide them with that. So uh, I'm sure folks will be able to provide that information that they learned today to their neighbors, and we're going to pass it on. I hope to see you soon. Uh, before we wrap up, folks, take a look. Uh, everyone who's here, take a look at the uh, contact sheet that we have. Rich, can we pull that up? All right, that's the contact information for all of our uh, speakers that are here today and their respective uh, entities that they uh, work for. And with that being said, again, thank you all for joining us, every member of the community. Until next time, we'll see you soon. Take care, be safe and be well.